Good morning. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Amen. So much so that y'all were so well dressed, I had to go get churched up a little bit. <laughs> Turns out I wasn't prepared for all y'all. <laughs> ah. <laughs> the true story is just not as clever, so y'all look so good today. Uh, I have a few announcements to start us off with. Um, first, we had a wonderful turnout at our food booth on the 4th, um, but Patsy rocked the place like she always does, and we have extra barbecue. We have so much extra that we have so, uh, enough to give away and sell today. So your donation, however you want to do that, gets you barbecue, buns, chips, and a drink for each person that you're picking up for. Uh, I think we get those in the Great Hall. Donation can just go in the offering plate uh, with a little memo attached to it. Uh, we are beginning to collect back to school items for our local teachers, for McSwain, our community to give back to people. So dry erase markers, tissues, um, pencils, construction paper, all the things that a teacher might need, uh, we are gonna collect and get sent to McSwain to start the year. July the 26th, we have a business meeting. When we conclude the business meeting, we're gonna have a congregational discussion. We don't have a talking stick, but we have one that we can get if we have to. <laughs> We're going to discuss the recent proposals and changes from the Southern Baptist Conference, what that means to you individually, and what that means to us as a church, and in a congregation, and our path forward. There will be child care available, uh, both in the nursery for the little ones and for the older kids, K through sixth grade, we're gonna have them in the gym, we'll have playtime. Uh, so it's, it, it's a good place to be always. It's an important time to be here on the 26th. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, the Stanton Augusta Waynesboro clothes closet, we're still collecting clothes that we will give away uh, one day only, August the 4th, uh, to the children of the community, uh, uh, in those three communities specifically. Uh, we're also collecting t-shirts, children's t-shirts, gently used to take to Kenya for our missionaries. There is so much. The last thing that I will bring up is August the 12th, we have a blood drive. Uh, Memorial has a rich tradition from yesteryear that we are resuming and back to. This will be our third one. Uh, we offer uh, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Saturday the 12th. Uh, they are anticipating collecting 50 units of blood from the local community, and it's just another opportunity to be here. And it's always a good place to be. Let's go to our Lord in a time of prayer as we open our service. Heavenly Father, I am so, so thankful to see so many familiar faces and so many unfamiliar faces in your house today. Lord, I ask that you would guide us and bless us, and as we take in the message that you would have for us, that we take it in, consider it, and use it. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Will you stand and sing 338, Wonderful Words of Life. Sing them over again to me, wonderful.
I did forget one thing about the business meeting. One of the topics for the agenda is fixing a few of our compressors that are broken for the sanctuary air conditioner. So if you're doing this, don't worry, the air's on. It's just all it's going to give us. <laughs> so today, as we worship through the word, let's turn to Romans chapter 1. And I'll read verses 8 through 17. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness. How constantly I remember you in prayer at all times. And I pray that now, at last by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to the Greeks and non-Greeks, both to be wise to the wise and the foolish. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is, as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Amen. We will stand and sing. One thing remains.
Thanks for your patience when I start the wrong song. Thanks for your never running out on me. You know, it is such a blessing to hear God's people singing all together. I, can you hear it oh, when yes. you're playing? Yes, that's... Yes. Can you all hear it? I don't think you can. Can You think we can sing one more time without sure. the piano? Just, just voices? You're worried that I'm going to start the wrong song. <laughs> I know! It took me a minute to realize I had completely played a beautiful intro to the wrong song. Mm. What do you want to sing? Turn your eyes. All right, let's do it. Just, just a cappella. You're going to have to lead them. You're going to have to start them off. Here we go. All right, let's all sing together. Choir members, grab a part. <laughs> Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim In the light of his glory and grace Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that the words we just sang would be our prayer to you. That we would turn our eyes to you in our time of need. We would turn our eyes to you in our time of joy. That we would turn our eyes to you just all the time. And when we look on your face, when we behold the, the grace and the mercy, the wonderment of, of who you are and the knowledge of what it is you've done for us, that all of these things that, that burden us, that weigh us down, that just seek to drag us further and further into the depths, that all of those things would fade away and we would remember that we are your children and we are called by your name for something special something different something more than what people can possibly fathom unless they know you as their Lord and Savior and so Lord this morning we give thanks for who you are for what it is you've done we give you thanks for saving us from ourselves, from our sin, from our inability to do so. Lord, we give you thanks for the hope that we have for a future, for the knowledge of what comes next. And Lord, I pray that we live our lives like that day after day after day. And it's in your precious name that we all pray. Amen.
this summer as the choir is taking a little break. We're going to have different music every week, and it's all going to be wonderful and special. You just won't know what you're going to hear until you show up on Sunday. And uh, we've got some wonderful things lined up over the next month or two. And this morning, we are about to be blessed by this beautiful, sweet girl. This is Sophia Latham. Sophia's 11. She's going to be going into the fifth grade. And she picked out the song that she wanted to share with you today. through the desert seen a cloud and forever over me but I believe the rain is coming I've been hanging on the high hopes cause you're the one that's making dry bones come to life you're the light I put my trust in every word you say is gonna come true you to the promised land Every word you say is gonna happen Even though it hasn't happened yet I'll build a boat in the sand When it's saying never rains I'll stand up and breath Do anything it takes you want And my sails shall end That fails a face Build a boat in the desert place So when the flood and the water starts to rise I'll ride the storm I got you by myself, you win in my sails, you love that fails a face, but about so let it rain. You're my map, you're my compass, you help me navigate the currents underneath, take the lead, I surrender. You say it's gonna come true You lead me to the promised land Every word you say is gonna happen Even though it hasn't happened yet I'll build a boat in the sand When I say it never I'll stand up and pray that I'll do anything it takes you win in my sails You love and fails a face Build a boat in the desert place And when the flood and the water I'll ride the storm cause I got you by my side You win in my sails You love never fails a face Build a boat so let it rain Thank you, thank you. I taught her everything I know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Today we're going to be in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1. We heard a reading from that earlier. Uh, Mark read beginning in verse 8. But you know what? Today, um, today is a day of good news. Hopefully... You realize that, that today is a day of good news. It's the best news, as a matter of fact. It is a reminder that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, that Jesus Christ lives, that he is seated at the right hand of the Father, that he makes intercession for those who know him and love him. And that is the good news. But frankly, we live in a world that showers us with bad news. Any quick look at the newspaper, a magazine, you get online, you, you open up whatever news site you look at, will reveal that the news in our world is not only bad, it's getting worse. And we find ourselves living in a culture that is negative, it's bitter, it's hostile, it's depressed, 
It's backbiting. It's despairing. You, you can throw in all kinds of terminology you want, but it's not good. There's a shadow that kind of lingers over our enlightened heads. And we really seem to be on the backside of human history. Very slowly, very surely, very progressively eliminating of the precious things that we had hoped for for the future. You know, we all thought that when we were supremely educated, that we would be able to solve all of our problems, solve all of the world's problems. We thought that when we were sufficiently industrialized, when we had invented enough creature comforts that we would be able to make life pleasant and meaningful and easy. I remember I used to love watching the Jetsons. Anybody remember the Jetsons? Meet George Jetson and his wife Judy. The Jetsons was this, this idea of what the future was going to be. Everybody's going to hop in a little flying car, and when they get to work, they can kick their feet up on the desk. Some of you may already do that, but you know, it's you get to work, you put your feet up on the desk, and you have the, the video conference. Your boss can look in and spy on you whenever he wants to. That has happened. But you have a robotic maid that takes care of everything. Well, we do have Roomba. Not quite the same. Instant, it's not rosy. No, it's not. Instant food, you go over and you push the button and food pops out. Well, we do have microwaves, so it's close. But you know, the further along, the, fur the further we are technologically advanced, the further we go down this road of creature comforts and trying to, to make ourselves, our lives easier, the more adept we get at physical science, at psychology and sociology and economics and everything else, the more we thought that they would make our culture better, it seems to constantly make it worse. And so people in general have gotten into this, uh, this certain kind of despair. You know, we, we hope for a better world, but it always seems just, just out of reach. Maybe just a little bit more, a little bit more here, a little bit more study there, a little bit more focus somewhere else. And it doesn't seem to work out. Because no matter where we try and enlighten ourselves, no matter what we invent in the, in the way of machines or now artificial intelligence, it doesn't help with meaningful relationships. And we don't seem to be able to overcome this continual pressing down, this reality of our own sin. And you know, we can look at sin from a, a variety of different viewpoints. But I wanted to look at it from four different areas this morning. You're going to say, wait a second, I thought the title of the message was a community church. Well, it is. But in order for us to be a community church, we have to realize why we are a church in the first place. We have to realize the community that we are destined and desiring to serve. And that comes with the knowledge that each and every one of us was at one point in our lives dead in our own sin. And the folks that we're trying to reach out to are still there. And so sin... We need to understand that man, mankind, is utterly self-centered. We really are. People, they, they want to please themselves. They want to make their own choices. They want to make themselves comfortable. They want to satisfy their own desires. They want to do their own thing and, and press the limits of what society will tolerate and even then go beyond that for their, their own well-being. You see... People in their own selfishness will consume everything in sight. They will take in as much as they can and then even more. Whether it's things or people. And in order to consume them, whether it's possessions or friends or careers or, or a spouse or a family member or an acquaintance, whatever. And when, when anything, when anything out there is going to suit your own self-centeredness, you're going to use it up. 
for your own ego and then you're going to dispose of it. You're going to discard it like an old shoe. Just going to throw it out in the trash. And so people throw away things, but they also throw away other people. And we are surrounded by a culture, we're surrounded by a world of people that feel discarded. We live in a world of folks who constantly demand their rights, who will fulfill their own ego at their own cost, who abuse each other in order to achieve their own personal satisfaction, whether it's business or marriage. You see, people can twist and pervert anything, and they will for their own selfish gain. So sin at its very root, at its very root, pushes humans towards self-fulfillment, towards self-aggrandizing, towards uh, making everything about you and not about anybody else. And the result of that is we become consumed with ourselves. And in being consumed with ourselves, we consume everything around us. And it keeps us. We have an inability to, to sustain happy, meaningful relationships with anybody else. People who are self-centered are unable to love. They're unable to give sacrificially. They're unable to forgive unconditionally. And because of that, they're unable to build a meaningful, rewarding, joyful life. Greed dominates the self-centered person. There's a second failure, there's a second part of sin that needs to be addressed, and that is guilt. You see, selfishness inevitably produces guilt. Once you've used up everything around you and you take a step back and there's nothing to consume, you realize guiltily that you are the one who have done it. You're the one who has alienated everybody. You're the one who has used up all of the goodwill and all of the resources around you, and now you are an island unto yourself. And you see in that selfishness, the guilt creeps out. Your conscience is pained. Your soul says this isn't right. Something is wrong about what's happened. And instead of trying to fix it, your guilt drives you to fear and anxiety. A fear of retaliation. A fear of vengeance a fear of judgment, a fear of these people that you've alienated turning against you. And so the anxiety that comes with that, that terrible tension that comes with that, makes people think that everything is going to go wrong and that everybody is now against them. Guilt produces sleeplessness, illness, all kinds of issues that we don't want to deal with. And so people will bury their guilt. They'll buy into all kinds of things. They'll go on crazy adventures, experiences or trips. They'll go down a rabbit hole of addictions to alcohol or drugs. They may go to a psychoanalyst and, and try and bury the responsibility somehow or pin it on somebody else. Well, it's my parents' fault. It's my work's fault. It's my dog's fault because he barks at me all the time. you would be surprised at how easy it is to point the finger at everybody except you in the midst of your guilt. You see, an anxious, fearful person becomes afraid of everybody around them, and they isolate themselves. And when you begin to blame others for your problems, you will alienate the ones that you need the most. So selfishness leads to consumption, which leads to guilt, which leads to alienation, which leads to a third thing, which could be easily called as meaninglessness or hopelessness. Life becomes a cycle of simply trying to fulfill your own selfish desires. You're on that treadmill. You're on that hamster wheel over and over and over again. 
and you feel like you're doing the same thing and you're never getting anywhere and you're never improving and all you're doing is getting worn out and you're more and more tired. Ecclesiastes says, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. In chapter 2, the writer says, I looked into my wealth and it provided me nothing. I looked for experiences of joy and they provided me nothing. I looked for experience of sorrow and they provided me nothing. I looked into relationships and I could not sustain them. I looked at everything that I had wrought and success in my career and yet it offered me nothing. Vanity of vanities. It's easy for life to become hopeless. It becomes nothing but an insignificant string of 24-hour periods that you just put together and you go from one day to the next to the next and nothing ever changes and nothing ever seems to go right. You see, the great fear that people have is a fear of eternity. They fear that life in its hopelessness, in its meaninglessness, in its nothingness, that there is no future and that everything is just bleak and dark. And so you have a culture that doesn't care anymore. They were so self-centered, so self-absorbed, they used up everything around them. They felt guilty and alienated everybody around them. They got on the treadmill and felt like there was no future. The news is bad, folks. See, Sometimes people think that just being done with life is a better choice than a meaningless, guilt-filled, anxiety-ridden life. And if you look at the world around us, if you look at everything that's going on, if you look at all of the technological pursuits, all of the education that we have gone after, if you look at everything that we have tried to, to do, if you assume we are as clever as we are, as, as educated and as lightened as we claim to be, that we would have been able to solve these painful realities that people deal with regularly. But the problem is, everything that we've done all of the studies and all of the stuff in no way, shape, or form has the ability to change the heart. You might be able to change the way you think. You might be able to change the things that you do. You might be able to change the things around you that affect you. But none of the things that this world has made will ever change our heart. And scripture says the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked and the wretchedness of our own evil, our own heart, wiggles its way, it pushes its way into every single facet of our life. And that is what is called sin. And the longer human history goes on, the Bible says the worse it's going to get. And if that's not bad enough, when we come to the end of ourselves and human capabilities and we're stuck with the sin and the selfishness and the guilt and the hopelessness, well, here's the really bad news. Jesus said that people will die in their sin. That's the really bad news. If, if it was all just social engineering, that would be one thing, but Jesus Christ said to the world, he said, you are dead in your sins and trespasses, and that there is no hope for you to be able to handle that on your own. But God says he will send all of the unforgiven, all of the sinners, all that don't know him to an eternal hell, and the manifestation of this sin that is in our human life is the bad news and we see it every day you're around it every day you read about it every day you may go to work with it every day it may be something that's still even in your own life and people question well what can deliver us from this what can get us out of this what can what can get us out of the darkness the shadow that's constantly hanging over our heads 
What is it that can fix this broken heart that we have? Is there anything that can give us meaning? And yes, that's what the gospel is all about. It is the good news. It is the counter to the bad news that we deal with day in and day out. Romans chapter 1. Let me read to you. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was born a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord through whom we have received grace and apostleship and bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. That's the good news. That's the best news ever. That's the message that the world, that we need to hear. See, here in Romans, Paul is is saying, he's saying a, a bondservant of Christ, a servant of Christ. You realize that, that Paul was an impeccable Jew. Amazing credentials. He calls himself the Hebrew of Hebrew. A, a, a very devout, religious, zealous, worshiping Jew, faithful his religion. He was bold, he's courageous, he's forceful, he spoke out. He was learned in the Old Testament. He knew everything that he needed to know about the law and the various ceremonies. He was educated in the Greek world, highly educated and enlightened man. He had ex been exposed to, to all kinds of culture all over the place. Different civilizations, different schools, different ways to, to teach and, and preach. He, he was a, a genius with immense gifts of, of energy and personality and the capability of speech and he was persuasive when he would stand in front of them and speak to them about things. This man could give a message anywhere in the world. And he says, I am a servant, I am a slave of Christ. Set apart for one thing only, the gospel. My job is to share the gospel message with you. That's what, that's what he was called to do. My task is to preach the good news, the good news of God, the good news from, from God to man. He calls it the blessed good news in some places. Sometimes he calls it the good news of salvation or the good news about Christ or the good news of his son or the good news of the grace of God. But over 60 times in the New Testament, he refers to the good news. And the good news is people don't have to live in selfish isolation. The good news is you don't have to live with diminishing returns for your own sinful behavior. You don't have to live with guilt and anxiety and fear. You don't have to live with hopelessness. That, that is the good news. That's the gospel message. And the good news is from God. And you have to ask the question, why would a holy God, why would a God like this want to give such good news to such bad people? Why would he want to do that? Why would he want people who are so broken and so sinful and so far away from him to hear such good news? Paul says, I have come with a message. I have come with a message of good news. Many of you have heard the name Socrates before. Socrates once said this, Oh, that someone would arise and show us God. I really still believe that the world is saying the same thing today. Oh, that someone would arise and show us God. There has to be something out there there has to be something bigger something different something something other than what we're going through oh that we could see god if i could just touch if i could hear if i could look upon his face then everything would be different well jesus did 
Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen God. They questioned him about his age, and he responded with, well, before Abraham was, I am. You see, God came into the world. He came into the world to bring about good news, good news from God. He promised a future. He promised us a hope. He promised us so many things, and that is the good news. You know, people are constantly looking, and they may not realize it, but they're looking to fill that hole in their heart. They're looking to fill up that, that emptiness that's inside of them. And they're really not sure what it is they're looking for, and that's why they indulge in so many different things. And for as many of us are in this room, there are that many vices that are out there to partake in. And people are constantly searching and seeking after something else. And yet, we have the answer. We have the answer. And the answer is Christ. You know, throughout human history. And this is why there are so many different religions in the world. Throughout human history, mankind has constantly sought after the divine. Because they had a desire to, to have answers, to have fulfillment, to have knowledge of, of what is next, and to not have all of this hopelessness, this uncertainty about what the future is going to bring. And so we recognize that in the midst of all of that confusion, Jesus came, was born a virgin, lived a pure life, was crucified and died for our sins, was buried and rose again on the third day. And it's important for us to believe that to such a point that we want to share it with other people. This year Memorial is celebrating its 60th anniversary. 60, 60 years ago, a group of believers saw fit to plant the church on the north end of town. They had the foresight the knowledge that the gospel needed to be shared up here. That there were plenty of churches downtown that they needed to expand, that they needed to, to have a church plant, that they needed to do something else somewhere else so that more people would hear the good news of Christ. And since that time, the Memorial Baptist has grown. There's been ebbs, there's been flows, there's been good times and bad times, times of boom, times of wandering in the wilderness. But through it all, the gospel message, the good news of Christ, has not changed. And through it all, we need to recognize that Memorial Baptist is a community church. It was planted here for a purpose. It was planted here for a reason, so that it would reach this community. That it would reach out, out of these doors out of these walls and go out into the community so that more people would hear the good news. You know, Mark made a, a comment a couple weeks ago when they came back from the impact trip. He was talking a little bit about it. And he said, you know, we, we went in and we were sitting down and there were all of these other churches that were around and kids from other churches gravitated towards our group. Two here and two here and three here and some here and throughout the week they all kind of rotated in and out of Memorial's group. Because they saw something different in that group. There was something different about this church. I've been in a lot of different churches. And some of you have as well. Some of you have come from other denominations. And that's one of the beautiful things, honestly, that I love about Memorial. It is full of God's people, regardless of the title that you may have grown up with. It is full of people who desire to worship a holy God, who want to lift their voices up, who want to, to hear the message, to hear the word, to dig in, to fellowship with one another, to come to Sunday school, just to do all of the things that we are called to do as a community of believers. And we need to hang on to that. But more than that, we need to, we need to expand on it. You know, over, over the years, if you, take a, if you take a look back through American history and even 
European history, you're going to see that the church tended to be the, the center point of the community, that everything revolved around church life. That's where folks went for bingo. That's where folks went for their recreation. That's where folks went to do this or went to do that. That's where they had meetings. That's where they had community meetings. That's where they had all kinds of things. It all revolved around the church. It was the fulcrum, the center point of the community. And over time, it's been watered down. Not in bad ways. But the church has branched out and they said, okay, well, instead of every church having a closed closet, we're going to do one big one here. Instead of every church having uh, a food pantry, we're going to do one big one here. Instead of every church doing every little bit of everything, we're going to join together and we're going to do something here. But what that has done, it has taken the community out of the church. No longer do people look to the church to come. No longer do they have a desire to come here for whatever. And I'm talking about the community, not the community of believers, but the community surrounding us. And it is important that as a church, we do things twofold. We worship in spirit and truth. We come together as a community of believers to lift our voices up to a holy God and we recognize him for what it is he's done in our lives. We do that religiously and that is important. But on the other side of that, we have to have enough love in our lives that we go out of this place and recognize the brokenness, the sinfulness, the selfishness, the guilt, the anxiety, the fear that is surrounding us in this world And that we love people enough that we want to share the good news with our community. They may know the church is here. They may see the lighthouses on the roof. They may recognize that there are activities that are happening. And yet they will continue to drive by until they know that you love them until somebody sits with them and shares with them the gospel message, until somebody comes alongside of them and puts their arm around them and says, hey, you're hurting, I understand that. I used to hurt as well. I used to be in that same place. Folks, we all have to realize that every single one of us at some point in our life where it's exactly like everybody else. Not a single one of us has lived a sinless life. And so the good news, the gospel message that we have been given is important for us to share. 1 Peter 4 says this, Most important of all, continue to show deep love for one another because love covers a multitude of sin. Cheerfully share your home with people. Share a meal with people. Share a conversation with people. Go out and sit down with them. Go and and meet them where they're at. Meet them where their needs are. God has given each of us a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts and we are called to use them well to glorify him and to advance the kingdom. It's a really simple matter. But sometimes we get caught up in our own fears and our own anxieties and our own uncertainties. And we say, well, what if, what if they say this? Or what if they ask me that? Or what if they call me a hypocrite? Or what if they they know more scripture than I do? All of those things are okay. A lot of people in the world, and this, this is sad, but a lot of people in the world will know and be able to quote more verses than church-going people because they study them to use them as a hammer. And they will pull out very specific verses and very specific situations to use them against church folks. Don't be afraid of that. Don't be scared that somebody is going to attack you with the Bible because they're just as scared that you're going to attack them with the Bible. Sit down. 
talk to them. Love on them. Share with them. Talk to them about your own insecurities, your own fears, your own anxieties, but then talk to them about Jesus Christ, the one who overcame, the one who is able, the one who brings us joy, the one who helps us out of our hopelessness, the one who gives us a future. See, if we don't do it, who will? We can't expect social media to do it. We can't expect the news to do it. We can't expect just people reading books to do it. We can't expect anything. God has called us. Go. As you go, make disciples. As you go about your daily business, share the good news. As you're at work, share me with other people. As you're in the grocery store, sing a hymn as you're walking up and down the aisle. Well, preacher, I can't sing. I don't care. Do it anyway. It's a conversation starter. You walk down the aisle, I mean, turn your eyes upon Jesus, you could butcher it. And you would still be sharing the message of Christ with people. It could sound horrible. Actually, I may do this. <laughs> this is a good idea. Now that I think about it, I may do this. I may go in the food line and just start walking around the store and singing a hymn as horribly as I can and wait for somebody to talk to me or look at me sideways. And you know what I could do? Because I'm, I'm a little weird, I'm a little off, and that's okay. I would turn that into a conversation. I'd probably look at them and go, yeah, I know I can't sing, but isn't it a great song? Do you know that song? And they'd probably look at me like, do you know the lyrics to that song? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his... Oh, yeah, I've heard that before. Oh, you have? Where'd you hear that at? Were you in church? Instant conversation. Because I sounded like a chicken getting its head cut off or something. There are ways that we can share our faith with people. Folks, people in our neighborhood are hurting. They have physical burdens, they have financial burdens, they have emotional burdens, and they don't know where to turn. People in our church are hurting. You know, I, I hear story after story about so many different things. Some things that I heard over the past week, too, that really stood out to me. There was a lady who finally sat down with her sister and shared the gospel message. Sister. Began to plant the seed. Began to talk about faith and love. Who Jesus is. And that's hard to do with family. I heard another story about a group of veterans who instead of riding in the 4th of July parade, instead of having everybody clap and wave at them and lift them up and show them the love that they are deserving of, they decided to skip the parade and go to a local nursing home. And they showed up there and they loved on the residents of that nursing home instead of getting their own accolades. It's things like that. Knocking on your neighbor's door, sending a card, picking up something. It's things like that that we can all do, each and every one of us. True service comes from a relationship that we have with Christ and spills over into every other part of our life. Let me leave you with this. One final thought. Look honestly. Look at yourself. Look at yourself honestly and ask, have you boarded up the windows to your own heart? Are you keeping people at a distance because you're scared or anxious. 
You are one of God's children. And when you turn your eyes to Him, and whenever you need to, let all of that fear and anxiety just slough off your shoulders and know that you are loved, that you are cared for, and that joy springs eternal in your heart. And each one of us is called to share that with the community that we live in. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the joy that we have. Lord, I thank you for bringing me out of the pit of despair and the shadow and the darkness that was my life. And Lord, I pray that each and every one of us is encouraged to go out of this place and also share that joy with others. That we would recognize the hope we have in you, hope that springs eternal, hope that just transcends every struggle that we may ever face. Lord, strengthen us, encourage us, remind us that you're with us every step of the way. It's in your precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. We're going to have a time of invitation. If you, if God is working in your life, if God has told you that you are not a believer and that you need to be, this altar is open for you. Come forward now. If you need to join this church, this is the opportunity to come forward now. If you need just a time of prayer, come forward now and kneel at this altar. And turn your eyes to Jesus. Let's all stand and sing. We are one in the Spirit. face that way okay they have to be able to see you all right where were you before this no 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 what state Missouri anybody ever been to Missouri oh 
Okay, I don't even know where it is on the map. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know it's that way, somewhere. I've never been there before. And why did you come to our lovely state of Virginia? I am here. I just came back. You just came back? Yeah. See, she came home, which is important. And now she wants to make Memorial Baptist her home. And so she is coming by statement and also by letter from her home church. And she would, oh, I haven't even told you her name. This is Kyla Green. And she wants to join Memorial Baptist. She wants to join our congregation, our family of believers. And if you agree with that, can we get an amen from the congregation? Amen. amen. And what that means is now we're going to put you on the Sunday school role and the church role. And the, um, and what are the openings? The choir. She's going to join the choir. The choir. She's going to work in the nursery. What other openings do we have? Oh, yeah. I, you're not going to get out the door before you're signed up for 10 different things. Okay. All right. She's willing, which is, which is an awesome thing. Why don't you have a seat for just a second? She's going to be up here. Uh, come by. Welcome her. We're going to make her uncomfortable by everybody saying hello. That's the way it works in a Baptist church, okay? You have uncomfortable and you have food. And speaking of food, don't forget, we've got barbecue in the Great Hall. If you'd like to take some of that home with you, barbecue buns, chips, and, and a drink, just drop a donation in there. All of it goes directly towards Kenya Missions. Join me as we close and have our benediction. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this day. It's a beautiful day, a lovely day, even with the rain outside. Lord, we know uh, that each and every one of us needs to be watered from time to time. And Lord, we pray that through that water, the growth continues to happen. Growth in our church, growth in our lives, growth in our spiritual walk with you. And Lord, as we leave this place, put someone in our path so that we can fulfill the Great Commission, so that we can share the love that you have shown us with somebody else this week. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. And we're going to sing this beautiful girl a song on her way out. How about that? <laughs> God's always gone.